Hi, my name is JJ and today I'll be giving a brief overview on server-driven mobile UIs. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been a software engineer at Capital One for about four years. I first started working on a partnership servicing website where I did a little bit of front-end, back-end, and DevOps work. Over the last year, I've transitioned to a mobile team and specifically I've been working on the iOS app. Our team is focused on bring more insightful transaction data to our customers. And what that means is helping them understand where, when, and how they're spending their money. So a quick introduction on what we're gonna go over today. Um, I'll talk about the brief history of apps, uh, a little motivation for what we wanna do here. I'll give over an overview of exactly what goes into a server-driven mobile UI. I will go over some valid use cases, and finish off with some tips and tricks on getting started. Apps have come a long way since the App Store first debuted in 2008. And as the app industry has grown in size and complexity, so have apps themselves. With better device capabilities, we saw a huge number of startups and companies take advantage of all the features provided. And what we have seen here with the trend of apps is that they've grown from these simple, straightforward services into these complex and personalized experiences. The next generation of apps that we're going to build are going to be much more dynamic in nature and will continue to capitalize on improvements to provide truly unique customer experiences. So what are some of the challenges with building a modern day mobile app? Well, I think for one, uh, modern apps have become much more context driven. And what I mean by that is that there can be an incredible amount of content to display to the user de depending on the user itself. Moreover, apps these days have to support a growing, ever-growing list of features. And with the same amount of screen real estate, it's important to think about what kind of feature and data should be displayed to the customer first. Now, I think the challenge here, once again, is that if we were to proceed with the standard or static way of building apps, what we would end up seeing is something really similar to this, where we have a, a number of products, and depending on the product, and depending on the customer type, and depending on this various things like statuses and feature toggles, we show this conditional UI view. And of course, I think we can all see that this type of code is just simply not scalable for the kind of experiences that we want to build. And so our core guiding principle should really be that front ends should be dumb. And what I mean by that is we should seek to delegate the single responsibility principle to our front ends in that it should display a view. Uh, all the conditional logic of what to display uh, and in the business logic should live in the back end. All right, so let's get started on talking about exactly what goes into a server driven UI. Now, I think for most use cases, uh, we can divide our server-driven UI into two components. One, of course, the front-end component, which is composed of templates, and a back-end that supplies data and content to those templates. Let's dig a little deeper into what front-end templates are. So templates have predefined UI layouts, and the layouts are static, meaning that the relationship between the labels and images are going to be the same uh, regardless of platform. But the content that uh, is delivered is going to be dynamic from the server. Templates can contain a very number of text labels, images, buttons, and really any sort of typical UI element you would see. And of course templates have their own implementations per platform, so you'll have different code for your iOS, Android, and web uh, components. Let's take a look at this example notifications widget here. So this might be something very typical you would see on a UI um, where we ask a customer to enable notifications. And uh, what happens here is that when the customer taps on or when the user taps on this toggle, uh, there is an updated text down here as well as an icon update here. And of course, underlying there should be a system preference change to enable notifications. So how would we break down this UI view into a template? Well, I think in both the toggled on case and the off case, we have some similar element layouts. Uh, we both have a title at the top. We have an icon, which gets updated. We have some explanation text, and of course the UI toggle itself. 
Now, when the user clicks on this toggle, all the elements actually stay in the same position. Uh, the only thing that's updated is the, the icon and this action text supplement, which just notifies the user of the current state. And so here's just an example of what this might look like in the code. Um, we have our typical UI labels, a switch, and a matching nib, which contains all the constraints needed to fill out this view. So that was a brief overview of what the front end template would look like. Let's talk about what the back end might look like. Generally, a back end consists of a single API server that serves JSON to the front end. And this JSON would follow a standard template contract and is the same across all platforms. The JSON would specify things like the text, uh, what type of images to load, any actions, and other conditional logic needed to actually render the UI. A single data source also means that if uh, there was a change in wording or if we wanted to load a new image, all we'd have to do is update the back end once and every single platform would receive that update. So let's tie these things back together now. Um, on the left hand side we have just an example JSON and on the right hand side I've put back the template. And so typically we would specify a template type. And in this case what we have here is really a basic toggle item. Now as you can see the labels are directly correspond with what is specified in the JSON. So we have a title, we have some primary text, the action text is specified here, and any images, in this case these icons, uh, we would actually probably specify a URL to fetch from. So the static part is pretty straightforward, but we can also specify exactly what happens when the user clicks on a toggle. Uh, in this case, what we have as part of our JSON is a list of actions. And for a toggle type template here, uh, we're going to have one primary action of type local update. And what this means is that the results of this action is going to update some items within this template itself. For, ex for instance, if the user clicks on the toggle and it succeeds, uh, what happens is we actually replace, we have some adjustments here where we replace the icon with a success icon. Uh, we also specify failures in our actions. So if for some reason the user clicked on the toggle and the action failed, uh, we could probably update this action text supplement that says, you know, we ran into an issue and we're unable to update your notifications. Now, of course, that was just the updates on the local end. Uh, most features would probably have to make some backend update as well. And so in here, you can see that as part of our primary action, we can also have an external update. In this case, where we can actually specify an API contract that the mobile device could call. In this case, we could probably make a post call to our uh, notifications endpoint. Now, this is just an example of what we could do on the mobile device itself. We could also have this update be specified as a backend parameter, where we actually have the backend make the API update. When we were looking at different use cases for server-driven UI, we actually found a ton of common UI elements um, that exist across our app. And of course, all these common UI elements could be templatized. And this includes things like modals, uh, different basic uh, button action templates. Um, a lot of forms were actually very similar in terms of the flow. Um, and we even found some really interesting use cases with charting, in this case, like this linear line chart. Let's take this idea of templates one level further. In this previous screen, what I've shown here, these uh, templates or, or widgets, they're generally small, and they can be pretty self-contained here. Um, now, if we define them to be self-contained, what we can say is, you know what, templates should be able to live anywhere they want. And so we can actually nest these templates as part of a table viewer collection view. And with that, what we can do is actually specify templates that contain other templates. And what this allows is for us to really reuse the same kind of components in different ways, and for us to compose components without having to specify the details here. Now, of course, our UI flows can often have more than just one single page. And so for 
us to truly have a server-driven uh, UI flow, what we're going to have to specify is more than just a single uh, set of views. And so what our typical data flow might look like here is that our mobile UI reaches out to multiple template engines um, or our backend server, which then fetches the corresponding static resources and backend APIs. And so just kind of a, a quick example of how this might work. So if we have a multi-page flow, uh, the UI would first initiate a call to the template engine. Um, the template engine would return uh, a, a JSON. And the UI then would log and trigger any local updates. So if there is some user action taken, such as a toggle or some user text field, the UI handles that. And then the UI then calls for the next step in the template engine and the template engine returns the next set of JSON, et cetera. And so with this cyclical pattern, we can define any number of different UI flows. Now let's talk about some concrete use cases. I think one of the first things that we found uh, and maybe an obvious example was A-B testing. Uh, if all our content is defined on our backend, uh, it would be extraordinarily quick to add new, to update your icons or update your text, and to do these smaller experiments. Um, the server then determines you know, what type of content to show. And, and in this case, we wouldn't have to do any sort of UI logic to, to kind of differentiate between uh, test population A or test population B. And what this enables is for us to really just uh, iterate through different prototypes extraordinarily quickly. So I think another really good use case we found is this concept of dynamic messaging. Let's just say that in your app you have some sort of notification center where you know you want to tell the customer about important updates to their account or you know just alert them to new things. Um, having a variety of templates can help you provide better details or more specific items to the customer. And of course, since this is all server driven, we can actually send updates um, to the UI uh, as soon as they come. And so if there's if there's something urgent with their account or if there's some new urgent um, uh, situation that we want to react to, instead of us waiting for possibly a UI update or an app update, we can directly push that um, to the customer immediately. A third really good use case that we have seen is this idea of a customized user setup. And I think this use case really showcases the power of server-driven UI. So let's say that after your customer signs up for your product, you want to have some sort of step-by-step -step guided setup of their account. Um, and th th this, this setup might be pretty complicated depending on the number of screens, the number of products, and of course, the number of steps in your setup flow. And you, know, you can imagine that depending on what the, the user selects, based on previous step, we might conditionally show them something different on the next page. So let's say that you want to add a uh, new screen um, to your flow. And let's pick some random feature. For instance, uh, we want to ask the customer to enable notifications. Um, normally, if we built something like this uh, into our app, uh, we would have to probably create you know, a new view controller and a view for this, for this uh, notification update screen. And then we have to you know, attach that logic to whatever previous screen we had. And we have to kind of also ensure that the output of our new view controller and view you know, reaches the right destination. And of course, all this logic would have to be duplicated across any of our platforms. Um, so if we were to take a server-driven approach, um, this would be a lot simpler, right? Because because all of all of this like business logic of like what to display next and where to display and what to display is, is now lives in a central place, and all our UI has to do is to kind of, all it has to do is it has to know what template uh, what the template looks like, um, and really just how to render the template. And because all this business logic lives in the back end, it actually is much easier to test this type of complicated flow. Um, you can imagine our test might look like just ensure that after each step, the JSON that is returned from our API server is a valid JSON error and contains the right elements. Um, we don't have to do any of this like sort of front end user testing of 
you know, clicking through manual, manually clicking through the flow to ensure that each screen shows up right. Um, and we can really just, uh, in, in this case, just isolate our test to maybe just this uh, notification enablement screen. Now, I want to end this talk by giving some tips and tricks on how you can incorporate something like this into your own app. I think when we were first starting to look at uh, this notion of server-driven UI, it can be pretty daunting um, to see how to, to even get started, right? There's so many different types of components and ideas um, and concepts here. So for, for us, though, I think one of the first things we looked at was we really wanted to define a good use case. Um, something that uh, a view that is static in layout but dynamic in content is always a good bet. Um, it also helps to look at kind of some of the shared components or shared screens across your platforms. Um, once you have a good use case defined, uh, then you just want to dive straight in, straight in and define your template um, and then have that kind of be implemented across your different platforms. Once you have your template defined, um, make, you want to then break down the contract itself, basically the JSON contract itself. You know, what are the what other titles, what are the labels, um, what are the icons that you need, uh, and more importantly, like what are some of the actions that the user would have to take. Um, I, I think one one of the, the the initial things that we did was we actually started with a static JSON. So so instead of us building out this entire infrastructure for you know the back end, we actually just loaded some of the static stuff directly from the app. And what this enables is right is this uh, decoupling. So the UI can actually um, any implementation can start asynchronously asynchronously from the back end implementation. And once you have uh, once you have that kind of all set up, uh, it's pretty simple to kind of incrementally build out your back end as needed. So maybe start with something simple like just a, a server that serves static JSON. And as you kind of uh, add more use cases, maybe your server, your API server then fetches additional content or has some sort of additional engine behind, uh, behind it to power, to power the data. Here are some other considerations to think through. For instance, uh, is it always gonna be worth the work to convert a feature to be server driven? Um, what are some of the best ways I can test my UI? Is it sufficient to have just unit tests, or do we still need full end-to-end -end UI tests? Um, these questions are meant to be open-ended, so I hope they can spark a little discussion. But I just want to thank you for listening to my talk, and uh, really appreciate your time. Bye-bye.